around the auditorium as they were singing, and there was a lot of you singing along with them because the, not only that you knew the words, but because you understand the magnitude of the message of that song. Uh, we have nothing without Jesus Christ. We have nothing without the resurrection, and because he lives, we now, have, we now can have eternal life, and it's a, it's a great song. Thank you guys so much. You did an awesome job. I'm not going to waste any time getting myself into trouble this morning. I want to dive right in. <coughs> I want to put two verses on the screen to create the pickle that we're going to be in today. <laughs> Let's just do it. Let's just rip off the band-aid and go right into this. Let's look at the two, uh, two verses here. Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 16 says, Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. A person shall be put to death for his own sin. Now here's the other verse. Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because of sin. Both of these verses are very true. Um, yeah, a person should be responsible for their own crime. You should be put to death for your own sin. And then in Romans we have through one man sin entered the world, and thus death spread to all men. Now before I go into stirring the pot again. I want to let you know why I do this kind of thing, why I stir the pot. I don't try to cause trouble to bring confusion to people for the fun of it. The Word of God is not something to be toyed with. I'm not, I'm not just trying, I'm not causing trouble because it's fun or because I, I'm entertained by it. The reason I do this is because I want to provoke thought. I want us to think. It's not just our, our, church relationship and what we do in church you don't just come in and you sit there and you listen to a sermon and say okay that was gospel truth so let me go ahead and put it in the storehouse of my brain here i'm just going to take it and go with it think think when you read your bible think dig deeper it's i want to provoke thought for years we've been taught that we do not question the word of god and you should not question the word of god and that sounds good and that sounds right but a statement that is close to the truth is still not truth it is okay to question the word of god it is not okay to question the authority of the word of god but to ask questions when you read the bible to have questions and to ask there's, there's nothing wrong with that we are by no means questioning the authority of the Word of God around here. And we are not doing that whatsoever. But we do have questions and we're looking for the answers to help us grow deeper in the Word of God. So let's start digging. Let's just go ahead and plant our shovels in today in these verses and let's start digging. If according to Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 16, the fathers should not be put to death for their sons and the sons should not be put to death for their, or for their father's sins. How is Romans 5.12 fair at all? How is that even close to fair? Let's look at that verse again, Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. I thought the fathers were supposed to pay the price for their own sins and the sons were supposed to pay the price for their own sins. And then we got this one in Romans here that says this one man sinned, Adam sinned, and then it's the judgment spreads to us all. It kind of seems like we have a problem. And I think this is a question that uh, hopefully I'm not the only one that's ever asked this question. I believe people have asked this question. Actually, I know people have been asking this question for years. Why, when Adam sinned, did we all fall under the judgment of that sin? Adam sinned and the judgment of that sin was spread to all of us. How's that fair? How's it fair that the disease that Adam infe in, in, uh, infected himself with became a disease that infected us all? How's that fair at all? Why did God allow it to spread? Adam could have just answered for his own sin, right? He could have answered for his own sin, but no, God opened it all up and it spread to every single one of us. How's that, how's that even close to fair? And I believe this is a question that's bothered so many people for so many years. Why is that that we all have to pay the price for one man's actions? And by the way, judgment does fall on all of us. Look at Romans 5.18. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. 
one guy commits the crime, we all do the time. It just doesn't seem right. It, it's just not fair. Why is it that we all have to pay the price for one man's actions? Many times we blame Adam for the messes that we go through. Have you ever done that or heard of people doing that? And man, if Adam wouldn't have sinned, we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in today. If Adam would just have done what was right, we would have all been okay. Our rage starts heating up against Adam. We, he committed the crime and now we're, we all fall under the judgment of that sin and we are, the temperature starts rising. You know, we start getting upset with Adam. Why didn't God allow this to be an isolated event instead of letting it ripple down through all of history? Why? It's, it's not fair. I want to bring some clarity to this subject, but as I do, my prayer is that it will begin to open up our story in Christ in a new and exciting way to all of us. Uh, there's so much in this question, and if we can understand what is going on here, Hopefully it'll open up a new aspect of your relationship with Christ that maybe you've never noticed before and never dug into before. First of all, let's try to reduce the temperature of our anger towards Adam. Everybody take that deep breath. Just try to let Adam off the hook just for a second here. Let's try to explain what's going on with Adam here. When we think about the story of Adam and Eve, we usually assume that Satan tempted them with the temptation of sinning against God. But what would you say if I told you that that's not what happened at all? Uh, chances are it shakes you a little bit. What do you mean? What do you mean Satan didn't tempt Adam and Eve with sinning against God? Of course he did. What if I were to tell you that's the wrong definition of what happened there? Let's look at the, look at the actual count in the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But the, the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. So far, there's no temptation given at all. It's just a line of questioning and a contradiction to what God said. That's all that's happened so far. Remember, at this point, Adam and Eve have never experienced sin. See, this is a truth that we do understand. Adam and, sin, Adam and Eve have not sinned at all. They've never experienced sin. They've never seen evil, and they would have no desire to do evil or wrong in any way. They have no desire to do anything wrong because they do not have a sin nature because sin's never been introduced into the world. So to tempt them with sin would be completely pointless. I'm going to tempt you to sin. I have no desire to sin. I don't have a sin nature. I'm, so to tempt them with sin or to sin would be totally wasted, be totally pointless because they do not have a sin nature. So let's look at what the temptation actually was. Let's, let's look at what it actually was. Genesis 3.5. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. What's the temptation here? Did, did say, Satan say, I'm tempting you to sin against God. I want you to sin. No, he doesn't. So what's the temptation? You see, Adam and Eve's desire was not to sin. It was to be like God. To know the difference between good and evil and to be wise. That's their desire. I want to know the difference between good and evil. You want to be like God? Yeah, I want to be like God. See, the tree can make you wise. I do want to be wise. Look at the temptation. Look at what Satan is tempting them with. It is not with sin, but it's with these things. These are actually admirable qualities. I'm tempting you with something that you do desire. Remember, if you don't desire it, it's not a temptation. And you've got a desire in order for it to be tempting. And these are the things that they are desiring. To be like God, to be wise, and to be able to separate what is right from wrong are all good things. They are all very good things. Satan was actually tempting them with what was good. 
but convinced them that in order to receive these things, they would have to perform an action that was ultimately in disobedience to God's orders. I'm tempting you with what you desire. You want to be like God? You want to be wise? You want to know the difference between good and evil? Yes, I do. Go ahead and eat it. They got so caught up in their intentions to please God that they neglected to obey God. Forgot about that detail. I do want to please him. I want to do something for him. I want to do something to please my God. Eat the fruit. You'll have all of that. Okay, I'll eat the fruit. You forgot about the order. And they chose to disobey God. This is exactly what the Pharisees were guilty of in the New Testament and what we're guilty of today. We get so caught up in our intentions to please God that we neglect to obey God. It's the same problem. The temptation was not to sin against God. It was to abandon God and choose human effort. They were trading God's best in order to do their best. That's what's happening in the Garden of Eden. Walk away from God's best and do your best. Please God. Be like Him. Understand good from evil. Go for wisdom. Do your best and please your God. Well, that all sounds good. But what they did was they traded God's best for their own best. They weren't pursuing sin. They were pursuing, they were pursuing a form of godliness. They, they, I want to be like God. The temptation was God-likeness. And when we understand that, it opens up a little bit more understanding of this story than we normally have. The temptation was not sin. It was God-likeness. You will be like him. You will know good from evil. Wisdom. Have all those things. Those are you, what you desire. Go for it. That's why it was a temptation. Is because it was a desire of theirs. The temptation was God-likeness. And the very second they bit that fruit, sin was introduced into the world because you neglected obedience for a form of godliness. You've, you've traded it. To see what's actually going on in the Garden of Eden may help us not be so mad at Adam. Okay, all right, all right. I don't have to be mad at him anymore because I see that he was trying to do a good thing. I can my, cool my temperature down a little bit because of Adam. But it doesn't answer the question of why we all have to pay the price for his actions. That one's still unfair. That, that one, we still need answers to that one. Something's still wrong here. God allowed this sin to spread throughout all of mankind. Adam and Eve's bodies started aging and falling apart, and they had a desire for sinful things. They're broken. They're broken. They introduced sin into the world. And now these corruptible bodies can only produce corruptible offspring. Two compromised people cannot produce perfection. It's, it's just not going to happen. Their offspring are going to be compromised also. They're going to be born with corruptible bodies also. It's like when a mother is doing drugs and when she's pregnant and her baby is born with that same drug addiction. The baby didn't perform the action of taking drugs, but it's b born with the same desire for drugs as the parent has. And remember, that's not a hereditary thing right there. That's an outside source affecting them. It's not, oh, look, you have the same genetics as your mom. No, we have the same outside source bothering us. The baby is affected with the same addiction that the mother is affected with. And it was passed on. Not only that, but now when Adam and Eve raise their children, they're going to be teaching them from an understanding that's tainted by a sin nature. Let me teach you about God. <laughs> from what point of view? From my sin nature point of view. But I'm going to teach you the best I I'm going to teach you the best I can about God. Sin started spreading throughout every generation up till now, but the sin was not only inherited, it was imputed. Adam's sin passed judgment upon us all. We were cursed because of Adam's actions and were born into a sinful state, and no, it's not fair. Let's just let's just draw a line right there. It is not fair. I'm not going to spin this message to show you how it actually was fair that God did this because it's not fair. It's not fair. But it is awesome. 
it's awesome that God did this. And to see me getting a little excited about this almost seems wrong, doesn't it? It, it, is, it, is, it is awesome that we fell under the judgment. One man's sin passed judgment upon us all. And that's an awesome story. That's an awesome thing that God did. And no, it does seem like I should not be happy about this, but I'm excited about this. When God allowed this to happen, he solved an equation that couldn't be solved otherwise. There would be no way to solve this equation unless one man's sin passed judgment on everybody. I didn't commit the crime. Yeah, but you're going to be judged. How's that fair? It's totally not. It is not fair. I didn't think so. We got that right, by the way. You got that right. If you're thinking, that's not fair. Nailed it. It's not. It's not fair. In math, we know that whatever happens to one side of an equation has to happen to the other side of the equation, right? It, it's got to balance out. So while Adam is messing up this side of the equation, God is adding the same elements to the other side of the equation. Adam's messing this side up, and God says, that's okay, I'm going I'm to put those same elements over here. Because what happens to one side of the equation has to happen to the other side of the equation. On Adam's side of the equation, we have one man who's representing all of mankind, whether we like it or not. You might not like that, but that's what's going on on one side of the equation. We have a temptation to switch from God's authority to individual effort. God's authority is don't do it. Individual effort is I do want to be like him. I do want knowledge of good and evil. I do want wisdom. So go ahead, plug your own effort in there and you can get those things. I'm going to switch from God's authority to human effort. I'm, going to, I'm just going to do this. And we have an act of disobedience which imprisoned us all. And in that we have an unfair judgment. That is what's happening on one side of the equation. At the beginning of the sermon, I showed you a verse in Deuteronomy 24, 16. Let's look at that verse again. Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. A person shall be put to death for his own sin. Now this is how God commanded a judicial system to work. You do the crime, you do the time. And we understand that and we agree with that. Somebody goes out there and robs a convenience store and the cop comes in here and arrests me, we're all going to see that as unjust. Now that's not fair. That guy did it. Why is he paying the price? So God sets up a judicial system that if you do the crime, you do the time. And we all agree with that judicial system. We like that. We absolutely like that. The children should not be held accountable for their parents' crimes. But what about us? What about us? Adam's sin affected us all. How, how does that make any sense? Remember, this is a judicial system that God is setting up here. It may be difficult to comprehend, but God opened up an enormous helping of his amazing grace, and he poured it out on all of mankind when he included us in Adam's sin. Why did he do this? Why did God do this? And here's the answer right here. Second Peter Chapter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Why did God allow Adam's sin to spread to all of us? Because he's not willing that any of us should perish. If God would have handled our sin on a case by case basis, we would have all perished, and that's exactly what he did not want. We would have, he would have lost us all if it would have been a case-by-case -case basis. Even on our best day, our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. How do I know? Well, let's look at our best day. Mankind, the absence of a sin nature, a perfect environment. All he added was his own righteous move, a form of godliness based on human effort, and all was lost. You want to know what it looks like on our best day? God gave it to us at the very beginning of the book. Here's your best day. No sin nature, perfect environment. This is your best day. What are you going to add to it? One act of righteousness. Oh, but your righteousness is as filthy rags. You get your own human effort involved in there. You try to please God on your own accord and you're going to mess everything up. So even on your best day, which 
that would be a pretty good scenario right there. No sin nature, perfect environment, walking in the cool of the day with God, everything's going good. What'd you do? I added a little bit of my own righteousness. And you lost it all. Even on our best day, we would have ruined it all. If God would have judged Adam right then and there, he would have perished. And the same goes for all of us because we cannot undo or pay off a debt against us, uh, of the debt of sin against a holy God. We can't pay that off. He is completely holy. So God changed the judgment from a judicial judgment to an act of love. Yeah, that's how judicial judgment should be. You do the crime, you do the time. But I'm going to move out from out, I'm going to move out from underneath judicial judgment, and now I'm going to give you an act of love instead. Why were we all included in the judgment of sin? So that we could all be included in the solution for sin. It's an amazing grace. God is so good. One man represented all of mankind on the first side of the equation so that one man could represent all of mankind on the other side of the equation. Let's look at the equation here. On one side of the equation, and you're welcome for the notebook paper. It just makes it more authentic. So here's the, here's the one side of the equation here. We have Adam plus a temptation plus disobedience plus an unfair judgment. And by the way, it is unfair. That's the one side of the equation. So we, ha we now have the one side of the equation set up for us. On the first side of the equation, we have Adam, temptation, disobedience, and unfair judgment. We're building a problem here. We are, we are now setting up a problem. What happened on the first side of the equation? God's going to have to recreate in the right way on the other side of the equation. Because what happens on one side of the equation has to happen on the other side of the equation. 1 Corinthians 15.45 Let's look at this verse. And so it was written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last man, Adam, a life-giving spirit. What's happening on one side of the equation? God is recreating on the other side of the equation. Jesus Christ is referred to here as the last Adam. God sent his son and started building the second side of the equation to provide a solution and I hope, you, I hope you're getting excited about this like I am. It's, it's really cool to see what God's doing here. Okay, you've done this on one side. I am going to start doing the same thing to the other side. And we're going to equal out something here. We are going to solve this problem. When the second Adam shows up on the scene, Satan wastes no time in setting the same trap. Do we see this parallel in Scripture? One Adam's on the scene, and Satan moves in. So when the other Adam shows up on the other side of the equation, what does Satan do? Same thing that he did on the first side of the equation. Matthew 4, 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command these stones become bread. Now remember, Satan cannot tempt Jesus to sin because Jesus does not possess a sin nature. Same problem we had on the other side. Can't tempt you with sin, but I am going to tempt you. He's tempting him to eat. Remember, Jesus has been without food for 40 days and 40 nights. I'm telling you, anybody, that would be a temptation. That's going to be a temptation. Take of the fruit. And in doing so, you will prove to be like God. Turn the stones into bread. And eat. I'm tempting you to eat. But Jesus does not bow to that temptation. So Satan tries again. Verse 5. Then the devil took him up into a holy city, set him on the pinnacle of a temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. He's, he's been tempted to eat, and now he's being tempted to prove himself. Show that you are the Son of God. Be who you say you are. Just be you. Just be you. 
Is it, attempt, is it wrong for Jesus to be himself? No. But if you're the Son of God, show it. Prove it. And Jesus refuses to take the bait with that temptation also. And then S Satan gets down to what he really wants Jesus to do in the third temptation. Look, look at verse 8. Again, the devil took him up on an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. And he said to him, All of these things will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. This is exactly what Satan was tempting the first Adam to do as well. Just switch authorities. That's all. Just switch authorities. God said not to, and his authority means I should not. Switch authority. Human effort. A form of godliness. Prove yourself. Do something for him. Be like him. Prove yourself. If you switch authorities, you can please God by your own efforts. But to switch authorities would be to go against the Father's will, and Jesus would not do it. He would not do it. Why? Look at Philippians 2.8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. This is the one thing that the first Adam overlooked. Your job isn't to do something for God. Your job isn't to show God how much you love him by your own actions. Your job is obedience. Obedience. This last Adam succeeded where the first Adam failed in the area of obedience. I can't get my mind off of what he said and I will obey. Adam and Eve lost focus on the orders that were given to them and they started craving God-likeness which they could have kept in obedience. The first Adam's judgment covered over all mankind and the judgment that was poured out on the last Adam did the same thing. One side of the equation, the other side of the equation. What happened on one side happened on the other. The judgment that poured out on all of mankind on this side of the equation, the judgment's going to be poured on Jesus Christ. And guess what that's going to do also? It's going to spread to all of mankind on this side of the equation also. Look at Romans chapter 5 and verse 17. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who received abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. What happens over on one side of the equation we need to make happen on the other side of the equation. Let's look at the equation again. On one side of the equation, there was the first Adam who was tempted and chose disobedience, resulting in an unfair judgment imprisoning us all. On the other side of the equation, there was a last Adam who was tempted and chose obedience, resulting in an unfair judgment offering freedom to all. But what happens on one side happened to happen, had to happen on the other. So if we're upset that we are represented by one man, Adam, then we should be equally upset that we're represented by one man, Christ. And I'm telling you, that part doesn't bother us at all. <laughs> Thank you, God, that one man represented us all. But when we look at the other side, we're saying, God, that's not fair. It's not fair. But what would happen on the one side of the equation, God was going to solve this problem by allowing it to happen on the other side also. If God hadn't allowed the problem to engulf us all, then the solution couldn't have included us all either. We would all have to pay for our own sins on an individual basis. And I want to help correct the way a lot of people think concerning this topic. It's often said, why do we have to pay the price for Adam's sin? You don't. 
Christ did. We, we think about it all wrong. I don't have to pay the price for Adam's sin. Jesus did that. And the price he paid covered all the sins connected to that. If it didn't include us all, neither would the solution. And it's amazing. It is so amazing. What happens on one side of the equation must be equal to what happens on the other side of the equation. So when you put these two slides together, or these two sides together right here, what do we end up with? What's the solution right here? That is the solution to the problem. What happens on one side had to be on the other side also. And when you put our sin and our self-effort and our human effort for righteousness, and then you on the other side of the equation put God's mercy and an unfair judgment poured on His Son who never did anything wrong, what you get with that equation is grace. And it is amazing. It's amazing grace. It's no longer a problem. It's a solution. By grace you're saved through faith, not of yourselves, not of works. If you try works, you're going to mess it up. I know, I've seen an example. <laughs> Sinless nature, perfect environment. What'd you do? I added a work. Yeah, but that's a filthy rag. It's never been about you. It will never be about you. It's always been about Jesus Christ and will always be about Jesus Christ. He could have left the problem side of the equation alone, but he decided to add a solution by imitating the one side on the other. And one, one man, one representative did it with disobedience, and the other one said, I will do it with obedience, and it will equal grace. Without sin, you have no grace. So the sin is important. But then obedience has to be there on the other side to offer a perfect solution to the sin equation. And that is grace. I am so thankful that we cannot lose our salvation once we have it because if we could, that is all we would ever do. That is all we would ever do. Grace is not only the solution for sin, it's also the answer for a godly life. Grace is unfair. Do we understand how grace is unfair? Totally unfair. By the way, a lot of times we say, well, God wouldn't be unfair. No, see, to put, the, to put that attribute on God is wrong. Well, God would be fair because that's godly. No, there's nothing in the Bible that says fairness is godly. Justice is godly. Goodness is godly. But fairness isn't godly. Fairness just means I got what I, I deserve. So, well, thank God he's not fair. Because if he was fair, you would have gotten what you deserved and Jesus Christ wouldn't have gotten what he didn't deserve. God's not fair. And I'm okay with that. I love that attribute of God. You know, unfairness, is that a godly attribute? Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> because it is totally engulfed in grace. Thank God he's not fair. Grace kept me from having no choice but to answer for my own sin, which would have been fair. That would have been fair. And grace allowed the innocent Son of God to pay the price for it instead of me. And that was unfair. When we see grace for what it is, we no longer try to please God by our own efforts because we see how inferior those efforts are. Grace opens up a picture that we don't normally see within ourselves. I no longer have to try to please God by my own efforts because my own efforts are inferior. We start seeing how undeserving we are of grace and we become humbled by that. I got something I did not deserve. Even my good works disqualified me from deserving that. <laughs> Everything about me deserves 
the judgment for sin and I got everything that I did not deserve. There is not one thing I could have added to the pot to make it sweeter. Everything I added with my own efforts ruined it. Grace shows me immediately that my actions are inferior. And we start seeing how undeserving we are of God's grace and we become humbled by it. And when you start seeing grace for what it really is, it starts deactivating your pride. I can't be proud. Why? I didn't deserve it. And nothing I did could achieve anything God gave for me. So even on my best day, I would just mess it up. Then what is grace? It's his best day. It is not your best day. Why did I get it? Because he is so in love with you. God is not good to you because you are good. God is good to you because he is good. End of sentence right there. He is not good because you deserve it. He is good because he is good. God is good. Yeah, but what about my efforts? Shouldn't I live for Christ? Yes, you should live for Christ. So that means I do have to put effort into this. I have to put my own works into it. No. Well, what does that mean now? How, what do I do now if, if I don't put my own effort into this? Then how can I live for Christ? Get out of the way. <laughs> when you died, the old man, when the old man died, it's dead. So what do I do now? I stop focusing on me and I start letting him live through me. It's not my works that I'm adding to my relationship. It's the works that he's adding to the relationship through me. It's grace at work. It's not by my works. Because it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. It's an amazing grace. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. Grace deactivates our pride when we see it for what it is. I am so unworthy of that. What are you going to do to make him happy? I can't do anything to make him happy. <laughs> Even on my best day, I can't offer him anything. Then what's going to make him happy? I'm going to have to get out of the way. Because me in this scenario only caused the problem side of the equation. <laughs> but his side of the equation offered a solution. So I need to yield to him and let him live his life. Let him be himself through me. We become so thankful for an such an undeserved gift when we see grace for what it really is. We no longer depend on our own efforts to please God, but rather we step out of the way so that he can be himself through us. Titus 2.11 For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace itself has become our teacher. Why do we walk away from worldly lust, denying ungodliness? Because grace screams that we are unworthy and Christ alone is worthy. He's worthy. That's it. It cries out the words of John chapter 3 and verse 30. He must increase. I must decrease. Grace tells us, get out of the way. Your involvement created the problem. God's involvement created the solution. So let him live his life through you. Grace shows us that human effort accomplishes nothing but obedience to God creates the mind of Christ Jesus. Grace strips down our pride and it humbles us. We are unworthy and we owe him everything. That's an amazing grace. Philippians 2.5 What is this mind that's in Christ Jesus? 
Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became what? Obedient. Not what Adam did, but he took care of the other side of the equation with obedience. God's not looking for your righteous actions. He's desiring to see Christ's actions through you. Get out of the way. It's such a beautiful picture when we realize we don't have any involvement whatsoever in our salvation. Nothing. It is God's grace and God's grace alone. My prayer today is that we are humbled by grace. We are humbled by the grace of God. I hope it humbles you. I am so inferior. Even my best actions are inferior. He's going to have to perform them through me. If you're not saved, I pray that you recognize how undeserving you are of that salvation. But understand that grace wants you to have it anyway. And if you are saved, I pray that God's grace deactivates your pride. And we come before him asking that he would increase and we would decrease. Thank God he's not fair. And be humbled by that. Stand with me this morning. Dear me, Father, I thank you so much for your...